Um, welcome to our very first virtual um, UL Symposium. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, this session, we are having Wiling Fong present to us. She is a graduate assistant for the Patriot Experience. She's also a fourth year PhD student in the higher education program. Today, her um, session will be on how we can use self-study to examine our professional identity in student affairs. She is welcoming you to please put any questions that you have throughout the presentation in the chat, and then we will have some time for Q&As um, at the end. So, but if you do think of anything, you know, please put it in the chat in the meantime, and we will get to that at the end. Uh, there is also the ability for you to turn on the subtitles if you need to. By doing that, um, you can click live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. So you can go ahead and turn that on if you need to. Um, but other than that, we can go ahead and get started. Wiling, how do you feel? Good. Ready to go? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think I got all, all the tabs open, right? All right. Um, but let me just make sure that I can see the screen. Okay. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for coming to my session. So thank you, Diana, for that very warm introduction. So today I will be talking about how we can use self-study to examine our professional identity in student affairs. But first, before we begin, I have a quick um, introduction prompt that I hope that everyone can um, share in your chat. I'm going to drop it in the chat. As well as showing, show it on my slide. Can everyone see the slide? The introduce yourself. Okay, good. So very quickly, just um, share your name, your pronoun, your department, institution, if you're not from Mason, and choose one of these questions. When was, what was your first student affairs role? And second, what is one personal value that you bring to your student affairs practice? All right, wow. Oh, this is great. So yes, um, as we continue having those in the chat, I want to thank you everyone for sharing. It's always interesting for me to learn about personal stories of our student affairs profession. And also this introduction question foreshadow part of my presentation today and where, where I will talk about what is a professional identity and why it matters in our, in our work. And one thing I want us to remember is that professional identity is closely connected to who we are as individuals and also how we see ourselves in our work and, when, and how we see our pro professional identity actually largely determines how effective we are and also how meaningful we see our work to be. So um, let's move on. So on to this session outcome. In this presentation, I will talk about three main parts. So the first is I will provide an overview of what is self-study research, um, sample self-study questions and various self-study methods. The second is I will talk about my own self-study research where I examine my 
professional identity in student affairs. And this was actually a class which I just took this spring called the Advanced Research Method in Self-Study of Professional Practice. And finally, I will share some recommendations on how we can conduct self-study practice in our student affairs work. So let's begin. So um, I learned about self-study research from the, the advanced qualitative research class that I took this spring. I didn't know what self-study is. And while the name seems descriptive, the idea behind it is actually quite intricate. For me, what I enjoy the most about self-study is the opportunity to take a look at our everyday ordinary details that we often overlook, put them under a microscope, and look at why we do what we do, right? So the objective of this first part of my presentation is to provide an overview of self-study research, but I will preface that this is not comprehensive because it's very intricate, but my goal is to provide at least a general overview um, for us to have an idea of what self-study is. So a little history of self-study research. It first began in the 1990s and it was used in teacher training. And eventually it found its way to various disciplines today. So anyone can do self-study regardless of what profession you're in. So self-study, like, like its name implies, is actually a systematic inquiry situated with our own practice. This means self-study researchers place themselves as the center of inquiry. It requires a critical examination of how we do things, why we do them. And we, so we can be aware of our own habits, traditions, and impulses. And this would also include our biases and assumptions. And while self-study requires ample reflection work, to be effective in self-study, you need critical collaborations, be it from your friends or your colleague or your mentor, and also interactions with the literature that, we, that your research question ties to. So moving on, um, in self-study, we have what we call the five foci that really explains what self-study is. So first, self-study research is based on a sit personal situated inquiry. It gives you the opportunity to examine your own practice and the questions that you're personally interested in, and if you are practicing what you preach. And second, self-study requires critical collaborative inquiry where you work together with either a critical friend, someone who really knows your work and is a part of the discipline that you're in or the profession you're in. Um, you could also work with your mentor or the students that you work with. And basically these participants would be critical friends who would journey along with you in your study and to give feedback. Um, it is also a great way to practice transparency in your research. So third, self-study is aimed at improved learning. So as we know, teachers continuously look at their teaching practice so that they can become better teachers. And any other professions should also emulate such practice. So the more that we look into our practice, we would be able to have a better idea of our where we can improve. So fourth, self-study study requires a transparent and systematic research process because it is a deeply um, internal process of questioning. We, we still need to make it very clear and transparent. So it means that sharing with your critical friend or your mentor how you come to your research question, what made you interested in this, what resonated with you. And also, um, it requires you to document your research process in a very systematic way so that there is like a paper trail that people, that someone would be able to follow like exactly what, how you begin, how you interpret your data, and how you come up with your findings. And finally, the fifth foci, the purpose of self-study is always for the greater good. It is not just for yourself, but it is to eventually contribute to your own personal development, professional development, and also the larger field of knowledge that you're in. 
So what self-study is not? Self-study is not about studying someone else's personal inquiry. It is not only about you. It is not conducted alone. It is not just reflection work. And then, and then it is not about gaining personal knowledge, but eventually knowledge that you can share with the wider field. So these are some examples of self-study research questions, which I think would be helpful to give us a better understanding of what kind of self-study questions are there. These questions are from my classmates this semester and I find them to be really interesting. So the first one, a math teacher examined her instructional choices before and during the pandemic. The second question, a literacy teacher questioned how she can use her personal identity and unique experiences to promote diversity through children's literature. A teacher of color reflected on her personal mentorship experience and how that is affecting her work as she mentors another teacher of color. Um, an, another classmate of mine, a doctoral student questioned how her past and present experiences impact her work in her doctoral math education research. And finally, a federal employee investigates how her personal identity as a woman of minority shapes her leadership identity in a federal government agency. So my self-study research. In my, um, in my self-study research, I actually look at how do my personal identities shape my professional identity in student affairs. So in this part of my presentation, I will share a little bit on how, do I, how did I arrive at my research question, the literature framework that I use to guide my research, my self-study methods, and how my thinking have changed as I proceed in this study. So the purpose of this research is really to understand what is a professional identity and how do my personal identities shape my work? And I think really is the big question for me is how can I bring my best self to my work? Um, so as a novice student affairs practitioner, I stumbled into the, the world of student affairs. So my very first student affairs role was um, as an academic advisor in 2017, when I first came to Mason. And I've always been teaching before this. So being in student affairs actually opened me up to a whole new world of how academia works. And I begin to be very interested, but really not knowing how do I fit, how do I make sense of my past experiences as well as my, my personal identities to, to be in this field. And hence, I decided like, maybe I should spend some time to really intentionally think about this. So as I started researching on professional identity in student affair, I learned that there are some issues that novice student affairs prof professionals like me face. So one of them is um, in a 2016 study on student affairs professionals, 20% of the entire student affairs workforce are novice practitioners. But in five years, 60% of these novice pr practitioners are actually leaving the field. And one of the reason is a lack of job satisfaction that many of these novice pr practitioners um, reported. So having a lack of job a lack of job satisfaction is often tied to an unclear understanding of what is one's professional identity. And this, of course, is an issue because it will cost institutions a lot of money when institutions have to keep training and retaining student affairs. So I dig deeper and try to understand what is a professional identity. A professional identity is something that we develop when we enter a profession. Doesn't matter what, but it is once we enter a new career, that's when it begins. And developing a professional identity helps us to connect our individual self to that work that we do. So it consists of our beliefs, our values, our attributes, and also the experiences that we bring. And it is often formed through experiences, 
and also meaningful feedback that we get from um, people around us. And this feedback will, e will eventually solidify and become the professional identity that we hold. So why does it matter? Why does professional identity matter in student affairs? The first um, thing that I learned from the literature is when we are, um, when we are clear about who we are in our work, it brings much more meaning and satisfaction into how we interact with our students and how we interact with our co-workers. And understanding our professional identity is also like a career roadmap because it will help you to understand where you have been, your journey up to this point, and then serve as like a navigation system, like where you want to go next. And also understanding our professional identity give us a better understanding of how our knowledge and our worldviews are shaped. And this will actually bring a lot of clarity to the kind of biases and assumptions that we bring to the workforce. And finally, prof understanding professional identity is a lot of identity work that will help us better work with students who are going through transitions themselves when in college. So just very briefly, the guiding literature that I look at in this research. So I look at professional identity in student affairs. The first thing I, real, I, I learn about is the external part, which is called the socialization. So socialization factors are things like graduate school training, internship, the mentorship that you receive in your student affairs work, belonging to professional organization membership. These are all crucial and can greatly shape one's professional identity. But on the other hand, I learned that there are more deeper, intricate internal levels. So it could be identities like your gender, your race, your education attainment. But also, I discover what this thing calls self-authorship. So self-authorship is basically an understanding of how your knowledge, which you once re rely on external things like the external world and how it changed to an internal understanding. So what happened is it is a transition. So maybe a novice pr student practitioner, they enter the field and they rely on external, fa um, external factors like maybe their boss, the organization to inform their work. But eventually through time, the, this knowledge will become internalized because it is combined with their experiences, the confidence that they have in the values that they bring to their work. And so I am, I am particularly interested to look at this part, which is that internal self-authorship part. So, so what I did is, um, so before I go into how I did my self-study method, I have to say that there are many, many self-study methods out there. And this is just one of the few that I have, I have selected. So first, I decided to go with memory work. And um, why I chose memory work? Memory work is underpinned by the premise that memories play a fundamental role in shaping our thoughts and action. So when we choose to consciously work with our memory, we will become aware of what are any undesirable thoughts and patterns that may intervene in our, our everyday practice. So for me, I chose to work with photographs. I set the boundary of choosing photographs taken from the year 2014 to the present. And why 2014? It was because that's the first year I came to the United States to start my international, to start my graduate studies. And I thought that that would be a good, sorry, a good time to, to, to set like that time frame. And then when I was going through my photos, there were a lot of them. I decided I need a question to help me select these photographs. So the guiding question was, how have I engaged with student services and campus programs as an international graduate student in the United States? So I collected all these photos, which will actually serve as my journal prompt. And the second method that I use is, um, is called personal history research. And personal history research is really used as a way for um, people to track their identity development because it looks into their own, all their past experiences and the land 
and the milestones that one has achieved. So what I did was I look at these photographs and I journal them in a chronological fashion. And as I journal, I also record down my emotions, my thoughts, and or any significant moments that I can remember. So that, that journal became my first data point. So aside from that, um, I also have a critical friend to work with because this is one of the important part of in a self-study research. So I have a critical friend who I share a critical friend log with, and we would dialogue on a weekly basis on the progress of my research. And also it was very helpful because we would come across literature and we would like look at what are the relevant literature that I can dig into. And she also largely served as an accountability partner as I document my research process. And additionally, this came quite late into my research. I begin to think like, hey, as I am looking into my professional identity, I think it's only reasonable that I seek the advice um, or feedback from my very own colleagues. So what I did was I created a Google site and I, and I selected some of the photographs that I've selected from my memory work. I upload onto, the, onto this Google site and I gave them some very um, simple questions uh, and ask them to give me feedback. So in that site, I also have a Google, um, Google form that my colleagues can provide their answers anonymously. And this became another set of data points. So in total, these are various data points that I've collected throughout my self-study research. So first I have that memory work journal from my photographs. I have my Google form responses from my colleagues. I also have my critical friend log, that weekly log that we would share and we would document our process. And also um, the class analytical memos are actually part of the class assignment that I've uh, done throughout my research class. So this is a little bit geeky, but I am, I'm just going to go through really quick of how I did my, my, analysis, my data analysis. So I did um, a coding um, method. So what I did was I just assembled all these data points together and I look at them. And then I, so I just go with an emergent method. Like whenever I look at uh, maybe like a word that strikes up to me, I would highlight it. And then I would if, and then I would group all these codes together. The initial codes were over 200. And then uh, some of the codes were descriptive, some were in vivo. And I was also recording my memos, like new reflections as I go along. In round two, I begin to sort them into categories. So I begin to see categories like assumptions, personal identities, emotions, and connections. And I just um, try to put them um, in like as close as they can be into anything that could fit. Um, so that's round two. But for round three, I begin to go back to my literature and I look at the self-authorship framework and I begin to code to use that framework to code my answers. I didn't have any expectation of how it would go. I just decided to, hey, let me just try this and let, let's see how it goes. So um, I, I want to say too that this is just my method. There are many, many methods that you can analyze and you don't even need to do coding like this. It's just that it was for my research class and we wanted a more um, deeper methodological method. But in self-study, you could just look at whatever data points you have without doing your coding. So ways my thinkings have changed. I have to say that I begin to have a lot of um, appreciation for the personal data that we have. Um, I, as I begin the coding work, I begin to see a lot of my assumptions, my biases and values surfacing. So one of them that I think took me by surprise was I was, when I work with students, I always think I have to have an answer. Like, and then when I don't have the answer, I would feel really bad. And then I, and then as I was doing that, I, I realized that I should not be thinking that. I should always think of approaching my work with a growth mindset. And that's, I may not have 
all the answers, but I could practice transparency and honesty with the student and tell them like, hey, this is also something new, but I am willing to work with you to, to learn this. Um, I also recognize a lot of pivotal moments throughout my student affairs career that really shaped myself into who I am today. Um, it could be participation in um, student organization or being more proactive in joining committees in my uh, department. So these are like little, little things that I feel like really contribute to the shaping of my identity. And also understanding this process gives me a better understanding of the student experience. Realizing that students, they transition and it is an, it's a, there is no ending to it. Um, we work with students who go through various phases throughout their time in college. So I will share just some recommendations of how we can begin to incorporate self-study research into our student affairs work. So first, um, self-study really requires a lot of digging deep. Um, one way that you could start is you could list questions relating to your personal practice that you are interested to explore and share that with a colleague and tell them like why they matter to you. And those kind of dialogue and discussions often lead to a lot of new insight. Um, another way is you can think about your very first socialization experience into student affairs and then journal on that experience. Or you could look around your office and you can collect specific items that you think describes who you are as a student affairs practitioner and you journal on that as well. Um, but I would always recommend that when you embark on a self-study research, decide on a specific time frame. So a specific, a specific time frame could be what I did, like I decide my time frame from 2014 to the present, or you could decide, okay, I'm just going to use the fall semester as my self-study time frame because self-study, is it doesn't end. You need to have put a stop eventually so you can start looking into your data and start learning from your data. Um, I would also recommend practice recording your thoughts, your reflections and your lessons learned on a regular basis. And you can keep a journal either digitally or manual. And actually this recording, recording journaling is probably one of my biggest and most surprising insight. Because when I first started journaling, I thought like, uh, where am I going to get from it? But when I was doing my data collection, I was like, whoa, like it is true that similar, like this emerging themes that keep coming up and up that really make me realize that, wow, these are the thoughts that really shape who, what I am thinking. And um, another way is, um, for professional development, you could create a portfolio to document your work or your, or your projects, and you can invite your colleagues and mentors to be a part of that conversation. And this is a great way to also um, look at your, your performances over the year uh, instead of just um, having a filling up a document at a time of the semester, you make it like a make it like a um, semester long project where you collect your projects, the interactions that you have and what and how they resonate with you. And finally, self-study can be done collectively within a group. And what I mean by that is if your department decides to implement a new project, right? Maybe like um, an assessment, right? All of the team members can come together and write about their thought process of what makes them decide on certain criteria when they decide on a, like a, an assessment. Um, it could be recording their emotions. It could be recording what they think to be perceived challenges and then coming together to share their, their insights. And very often they, um, they are very valuable because it is the, the little things that we often overlook but matter so much. And finally, yeah, I want to share this quote, which um, I think is the heart of all self-study, which is change is the end result of all true learning. That's it. And yeah, Diana, what time are we at?
We have 30 minutes left in the session for, for the scheduled time. So thank you, Wyling. That was really great and really cool information to learn. So now is a wonderful time to open up for questions. Um, if you would like to ask any questions, you are definitely welcome to do so in the chat, or you can unmute yourselves or turn on your video to ask questions directly to Wyling, whatever you're more comfortable with. Hello, this is Philip Wilkerson. Uh, very wonderful presentation. Uh, one of the things that stood out was uh, um, uh, in regards to, and I might have missed it, uh, in regards to your self-assessment, you have collaborative and partners that kind of give you that outside view of yourself. Um, did you, in this presentation, speak about who those people are for you? Oh, um, yeah. And if so, if you did or didn't, can you expand upon that? Who are those people for you? What do they give you? What insights? And then, um, I guess, what would be some values or, or ways that you assess that this person would be someone that you would listen to rather than, you know, you know critical feedback rather than they just kind of are mean or whatever, you know what I mean? You know what I mean, right? Like Yes, yeah. Um, Phil, that is a very important and valid question in um, self-study. So for me in our class, we were matched with another person whose research is um, related to my field. So, uh, but this, I, this idea of who to select for as a critical friend surfaced a lot in our class conversations. And um, one, one good way is definitely someone you can trust, someone who you um, can work with well, but also someone who is willing to be honest and not just a friend who would say, oh, this is great, 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 but someone who would come in and challenge your thinking. So it could be someone who is um, a friend, a, a, a colleague that you can wear, that you can work well with, you can have great conversations with. Um, it could be your boss who is willing to provide that um, time to also be a part of your self-study journey. Um, but yeah, I think what is important for me when it comes to selecting a critical friend is someone I know who can be honest and also push back on some of my ideas and not just agree um, because you need that because self-study is such an internal way of looking at your own research and it's so easy to just go along with everything you think is is right right so yeah I, I think someone who who would be honest I think that's one way Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Great question, Phil. Um, if anybody else has any others, again, please feel to put them in the chat um, or ask out loud. I also have just put in the chat the link to the assessment for this session. Um, so please just be sure to open that before you do leave the session so that way you can access it um, after you leave. I'm also just putting in the chat now the link to the schedule for the um, remainder of the um yes phil sorry about that i'm i just put in the chat the remainder of the schedule for today just in case you wanted to check out some other sessions um and i will put in the link for that i have for this session assessment let me get yeah, that we have here. ashley thanks Eileen. hi um, ashley yeah how are you i'm good how are you <laughs> I'm good. I just wanted to ask a quick question. If you could, um, I'm really interested in the data that you were talking about at the beginning, um, in which you were talking about um, the novice professionals and leaving the um, the field within five years. If you could share that resource, um, I would be really interested to read more about that. Yeah, sure. I can definitely email that to you. Uh, you. But yeah, but really, that was also one of the my surprise. Like how people actually, aside from lack of satisfaction, burnout is also another reason that novice pr practitioners leave the field. I would say that's not just novice practitioners, but, <laughs> yes. but I, would, I, I am curious to read the study because I want to I wanna know about like specifically what was unsatisfying to people. So if you wouldn't mind sharing it, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Oh, we have Erin. Hi, yes. 
I'm curious um, how you created a sort of container for your friends and and colleagues so that they felt safe sharing um, um, candid feedback. I know you mentioned um, part of it was anonymous, but also sort of connected to that. Uh, well, first with that, um, what did you say to them? How did you introduce it to them? And then second, how, how did you develop the questions that you wanted to ask? Um, and if you feel comfortable sharing a few of the questions that you, that, that you asked, I would be interested in hearing that as well. Oh, yes. Uh, so these, I selected um, supervisors who I have worked with and a few colleagues, current colleagues. Um, I think it was, for me, it was very laid back. Like I just say, hey, I'm doing this self-study. I would like your response. Like, would you be willing to share? And yeah, they were like, yeah, sure. Because I think it was such a casual setting like I wasn't really asking any deep questions. It was more like, hey, look at my photographs and see how do these photographs reflect my identity when we work together. I think it was along those lines, like how do my um, personal identities surface in these photographs? One of the questions was that. And then I also have them um, just have like an open question saying, uh, asking them like, um, what other personal identities that you see surface throughout it in our interaction in the in our work and yeah so it was along those those lines yeah the questions great thank you Awesome question so far. Do we have any other questions for Wiling? All right. It seems like that may be it. Um, you can definitely reach out if you do have any further questions. Oh, Whitney, looks like you're on with us. Yeah. Hey, Wiling. Great hey, job. Wiling. I had a question and I sort of popped in later. So you may have addressed this in the beginning. Um, but blogging and journaling, I, I actually do personal self journaling. Um, but in this process, um, I think you did it electronically versus mm -hmm. um, based upon what you're sharing. Did you just every single day, I'm trying to just see what it looks like every day, mm -hmm. um, type into whatever document, you know, today, I experienced blah, blah, blah. What did your journaling look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some people did that, the daily thing. But for me, because I chose to journal from a collection of photographs, so that became my journal prompts. And I was taking, I took a few, a few weeks, I think maybe two weeks. I could not write it all at one point because I felt like when I was journaling, one thing I realized was it was hard on many levels because emotionally, like, photographs don't only show you what happened at that time it will bring back a lot of memories and then but those memories are actually very important data as well so I took um, two weeks slowly you know like whenever I feel like it I would journal and then at the end of two weeks I realized okay this is it this would be my data point but there are um, some of my classmates who chose to journal on a daily basis throughout the semester and it would usually be Maybe after they finish teaching a class, um, then they have insights, then they would write them down. Yeah. Oh, we have Erin. Erin, is this your second question? Your hand it, is you raised. It is my second question. Oh, yes, sure. <laughs> um, you know, if there's other people. Um, I'm curious, again, if you feel comfortable sharing if you learned anything with this study that was unexpected, if you got feedback that surprised you. Hmm. Um, I, I did, I did. Um, actually, um, one of my biggest turning point um, is realizing that the work, the programs that we have, even if we think like, like for example, we run a lot of programs, right? Like student, uh, like everyday programs. 
And sometimes when we look at the participation, we may think like, oh, it's not really working, like no one is really attending. But just having those programs there mean a lot. And for me, when I was going through my transition, I realized that I rely a lot on these programs to just feel like I'm acclimatizing to the university. And it made me change my mind, like thinking like sometimes it's really not about how many number of students attend, but just having and providing these programs there and letting students access these programs in their own time. I realized this as well in my journey. Like I may have realized and saw this event and it took me a while to eventually participate. But the fact that it is still there and then eventually it provided me an access to the event and I learned something from it or perhaps I formed friends from it that really helped me with my transition. So I think it gave me the validation that the work that we do, the programs that we have, it, it matters, like just being there. I hope it answers your question. Thank you. So many good questions. I think that maybe it, Wailing. Um, it was a really amazing presentation. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, really enjoyed it. But we are at about 11 o'clock now. So if anybody does have any other questions, um, definitely please feel free to ask. But otherwise, I believe we can wrap up. If you wanted to say anything else in closing, Wailing, please feel free. Um, but other than that, you all can take a few minutes break before we get started on the next um, session for, for the UL Symposium. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Very grateful for all of you who came to hear this presentation. But yeah, thank you again. Hey, Wailing and Deanna. Just wanted to say good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good yeah, uh, it was extremely informative and um, I just appreciated the information um, and that process of learning it just in a different way. Yeah, thank you. So. All right, Wailing, I think we're good to finish up the meeting. That was really, really good. Awesome thank job. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, so I'll stop recording mm. and end it and I'll save the chat and then all of that will be uploaded to the website. Okay. Amazing job. Great, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.